So Zechariah is going to talk to us, I believe, about um, data analytics, big data, uh, Kafka pipelines of data, and uh, integrating Spark, I think, into some of that uh, for notification. Yeah, perfect, great. Take it away. Hi. My, so, uh, as you mentioned, um, I am presenting on Apache Kafka and using Apache Camel uh, for, you know, getting data in um, and then using Spark structure streaming um, to build a data pipeline. So, a little bit about me. Um, I work on the data analytics platform at Red Hat. Um, we build on top of OpenShift. Um, we leverage Apache Spark as our analytics engine. Um, if you're interested in finding more details about our project, uh, you can take a look at um, Rad Analytics IO. Or, and uh, if you're interested in you know, getting these slides as well, you can check out my Twitter. Um, I just posted the slides. So the agenda, I'm going to briefly you know, go over what ETL is, some of the problems. Um, I'm going to talk about an Apache project called Apache Camel that lets you do a lot of interesting things when it comes to ETL. I'm going to talk about data formats and schemas and why they're important. And then I'm going to talk about processing data streams and I'm going to go into some architecture. I also have a demo app, so I'm hoping that this, in this uh, 20 minutes that I'll be able to show you guys you know, some, some stuff. So. Um, So let's get into it. So what's ETL? Um, ETL is short for extract, transform, and load. So there's lots of different technologies out there that you could use um, in order to do some of this stuff. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about is stuff that's open source. Um, so what are the problems right now? So you're getting data from so many different sources, right? We're, we're at a conference here. We're talking about a lot of devices, um, and folks want to do maybe analytics on top of that. So there's, you know, data is coming from sensors, medical devices, mobile phones. Um, they're coming in different formats. Some, sometimes it could be the developer decided to, you know, um, put it in a format like JSON. Um, and then some, some other developer decided to use, you know, a, a format that's more structured. Some people just, you know, send a large text or binary. Um, and you know what's interesting is when, when you want to do analytics, right, you, you might want to do, you know, you want to mine that data, you know, maybe do sentiment analysis. Like, for example, if you have uh, comments on a form, you might want to do some sentiment analysis to see, you know, if you're getting positive comments for a product that you're selling or whatever that, that you're using. Um, um, and also natural language processing is another thing that you might want to do to understand your user. Um, if they're typing messages to you, you want to know what exactly that they're um, trying to reach. So Apache Camel, why I chose um, that as a good technology is, um, one, it's open source. Two, um, it has over 200 um, source and syncs. So what I mean by source and sync is pretty much you get data from one system, and then you send data to another system. In between that process, there's a way that you can do your transformation, your cleaning, and, and other things that you want to do. But out of the box, um, it supports AMQP protocol, um, MQTT, which you know there are talks here at this conference about, um, and a lot of other protocols and databases and uh, systems. So let's go over a very simple example. So if I'm today a new developer trying to do uh, a Camel application, what do I need to learn, right? Um, if you know Java um, or if you know XML, um, you could create a route. So there's this thing that we call DSL. Um, so um, in this section over here, you see that I point to extract, right? I say that this from statement is saying, I'm going to extract. And then in, before the semicolon, you see 
the component that I'm using. I'm using the file component. I could easily use MongoDB component and pull from a database. I could use JMS. I could use AMQP. I could use different protocols, whatever I choose to do to get my data from. And then in the middle there, I have a bean and a method. And what happens is anytime there's data that, that gets picked up, it'll go through that bean. It'll run through custom code that I've created. And then it's going to spit it out and put it in, a, in another location where I specify the two. So it's pretty simple when, when you look at it. Like, you know, um, that's basically just a very simple, simple route. But you know, life can get complicated. You know? But first off, let's, let's understand one concept here. Um, so there's a concept in messaging is producer and consumer, subscriber and publisher is another way to uh, give an example about it. But pretty much you, what you're doing is you're sending messages. Um, the advantage of having message, messaging is that you're not using HTTP. So you know, some folks might be, might be wanting to integrate with uh, you know, other systems every time some event happens in, in your application. You might have another team that just wants to get uh, a notification of this event. right? Um, they could subscribe to a topic, um, whether you choose to use Kafka or whether you choose to use any other system. right? And then get that notification. So you know systems can get more complex, right? And uh, there's a couple of consultants that were were out and they were building a lot of systems, and they found that a lot of problems happen, you know, in a lot of places, and sometimes it's the same problems. And they came out with uh, enterprise integration patterns where they wrote, you know, patterns of what problems are repeated in a lot of places, and I'll just walk you through this particular um, an example of something. So you might have a message that comes in, a new order, and then you want to make a copy of that message and send it somewhere else and store it. But also, you don't want to wait for a response. You want to still send this message and get it split, and then you want to send it to a recipient depend on, in a recipient list. So you, so you send it to those recipients, then you filter that message, and you decide if this condition is true, then to do something different. So, you know, a lot of times, before we get to the analytics part of any system, um, often what, what happens is you gotta, you got to be able to you know, clean your data and, and put it in a structured format. And we're going to talk about structure in this section, schemas and data formats. So schemas are important. Um, you want to have something that, you know, um, you know and, and data can change. Fields can be added. Different things can happen. You know, applications can, can, can support different features, and schemas will change over time. And that's something important when you're developing APIs or, and developing systems. So let's talk about some common you know, you know, formats that, that exist today. So there's text, JSON. Those are very common. A lot of people use it. Avro and Parquet are a little bit, you know, a little bit better because you know, it gives you um, if you're storing your data in, in like HDFS or some distributed file system, um, you want to have it splittable, you want to have good compression, and you want to have a schema. And Avro and Parquet checks off all the boxes in, 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 in my requirement in, in storing data in, in a data f format. And then there's Thrift and ProtoBuff. Um, it does have schemas, but it's not as, as rich as uh, what you would get with Avro and Parquet. And those are also Apache projects. So this is what a schema looks like in Avril. It's basically JSON. Name is optional. ID is you have to provide the ID for, for this field. So stream processing. So I got to go really, really fast since we only have 11 minutes left. So I have a demo app that I want to just show you um, to demonstrate all this stuff. I'd rather not just show you slides and, and, and you know, not show you practical stuff you can take home and you, know, you can implement in, in your own uh, way. So Basically, I got a Camel web service, and I'm using Camel to stand up a web service. And every time a message comes, or a, a, a JSON post request comes in, what I do is I do two things: I store inside Cassandra database, and I also send a message to Kafka. As soon as the message gets sent to Kafka, um, it's going to be stored in, uh, in in basically JSON format. But once the JSON comes in, I use Spark Structure Streaming to listen for messages that come in and store it in a data frame. And if you don't understand data frames, 
don't be afraid because um, I'm going to just think of it as a table. Okay? Just imagine in your head, this is a table, and every time a JSON comes in, it gets stored like a record in a database, like in a table. Just think of it in that way. That'll make this uh, example more easier to understand. So when you have that data frame, right, um, you'll have like entries in there. And those are going to be stored in HDFS. We talked about uh, data formats in a previous slide. So Parquet is really, really advanced in terms of having columnar technology, where it does a lot of optimizations, compression, and has a schema. And it's, it's really nice um, when you, when when you want to offload some data. And since you're storing in Hadoop, you're getting the advantage of distributed. So let's try and understand Spark. Why is Spark important? Um, it's distributed, right? So when you're doing computing and when you're doing you know, processing, um, you don't want to do it like with, with a single you know, uh, core. You want to do things you know, distributed. You want to use multiple servers. And in, in this example that I have, I'm actually using Spark in containers. And it's distributed um, using um, Kubernetes, the, the, the Kubernetes uh, you know, version that we use with, with, um, with Red Hat that we build on top of called OpenShift. And um, so let's, let's go like, into the features, mainly um, the fact that Spark, when you want to build an application for Spark, you can choose to build in, you know, in Java. You can choose to use Scala or Python or R, um, which is very popular in the data science community. Um, and then you have data access, where you can use JDBC, HDFS, or S3 as your data store. Um, and then you can also persist in those different formats. So we talked about Avr, we talked about Parquet, we talked about JSON. Um, and this is basically the building block of what Spark um, platform looks like. So there's the core, there's Spark SQL to do querying. We're going to use that in the demo to, to query live data that's, that's getting fed into the, the uh, HDFS uh, warehouse. Um, and then we, we can use machine learning if we want, we can use graph if we want, but we're just using streaming right now. We're using structured streaming, which is very new. So this is just high-level architecture. I'm not going to go into the deep, uh, you know, intricate details because we do uh, have about eight more minutes, and I want to do a demo. So this is Jupiter. Okay. So as you can see, I'm going to basically uh, run this. So Jupiter is what we use um, for for doing you know, just some POCs or you know, trying, to, trying to print out some, some graphs, some charts, and try to analyze some of your data. So I'll just walk you through what is going on over here. So you, I'm basically reading from HDFS warehouse, which is right here. These are Parquet files that I'm storing. And pretty much, I'm, I'm using SQL, as you can see. And then I'm doing a, a count. I'm doing a group by on product ID. And I want to know how many, how many orders do I have per product ID. And I have that. I want to know what's the maximum quantity. I have that. I want to know, can you put it in a bar graph? Can you put it in an area graph? And I have that. So I'll be able to POC certain stuff and experiment. So let's try and make this a little bit more interesting. So I got a script here. We're going we're gonna to try and uh, you know, simulate actual orders coming in. So when I run this, it's going to connect. It's going to pick an, a random uh, you, you know, customer ID. It's going to pick a random product. And it's going to post it over here. Um, so as you can see, I have 22 orders. If I refresh this, it should say 23. It should also give me different values, and it should update all the stuff. So let's see if my demo crashes or not. Hopefully, you know, that's the best part. No uh, safety net. So that's 23 right there. So let's look at, you know, just let's, po let's pop the hood. Since we have six more minutes, let's, let's go into it a little bit more deep. So what do I have here? I have containers, OK? So I have pods. So this is, when I deploy this Spark streaming application, it's long running. What, what I do is, um, actually, you know what? 
since we're very short on time, I'm just going to show you a, like a video of how I set all this stuff, okay? And then I'll talk through it. All right. So I just have my Camel web service up at this point, and then I have my Sp Spark Py Python Spark streaming application. I give it a Git URL, and what it does is when once it, once I give it the Git URL, it will go and get the source code. It will build up an image and deploy that image into a Docker registry. And then once that image is deployed into a Docker registry, it will deploy that in a container, in a pod, and also deploy um, Spark cluster as well along with it. When the job is done, the Spark cluster gets teared down and, and everything's finished. But in this case, since this is a structured streaming application, this is long running, so it's going to keep on running as long as this application is up. So another point that I didn't mention in, in the slide deck is that you, when you're doing a Spark structured streaming application, you want to make it fault tolerant. So there is this thing called checkpointing. So you can do checkpointing where you say, you know, w because Kafka has offsets, and you want to make sure that you don't go back in time. Once you get a message, you process this order. You, wanna, you don't want to process the same order again. So as you can see right now, I'm connecting to my, my Spark cluster, and I'm deploying this application, and it's, it's running. Okay. So as you can see, it's running, and it's, it's getting loaded up. So spinning up, now it's connected to my HDFS warehouse. There's my warehouse. It's empty. There's not much files in there. Um, Going to set up my, you know, Jupyter notebook. You know, get my code up there. Set things up. We'll fast forward some of this stuff so so you guys don't have to, you know, be seeing this stuff. <laughs> 